Okay, we're recording. Chris, I'm so excited. Chris from Therapy Outside the Box. That is it. I don't even know if there's a box anymore. Maybe there's there no never box. was. There never I'm, was one. But if there still is, I'm definitely outside of it and happy. You're definitely. I too am. I never believed in boxes in the first place. <laughs> right. That's kind of what I was getting at. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love it. So you and, and I have been pen pals. Excited to be here with you today. Me Very, too. Really excited. Yes. Yeah. Pen pals. Wow. There's a there's an antiquated uh, concept. <laughs> We've been Instagram pen pals. Yeah. Which is funny because. I mean, I've only been on any social media for maybe three and a half years. Mm -hmm. That's it. I mean, I was never into it. Um, I don't even know what changed my mind. Somebody really suggested that when I was going through my whole shift and transition, and obviously that was going to be going to kind of a renaming or a rebranding or whatever, that it's probably time to step out into a forum like that. And for whatever reason, I just chose Instagram. Mm -hmm. And it seems like pretty soon after I got on there, I I was running into you or you mm -hmm. me. I don't even think either of us know how that happened, but uh -huh. it just did. Yeah. But and I I honestly learned so much from your posts. I think you know that because I comment mm -hmm. a lot. And the, the way like you you come at um what you're putting out there is so educational and so um there's a there's a better word i'm looking for you just seem to know how to be zeroed in on what you believe your i you know whoever you were you would be endeavoring to reach needs and wants to hear i don't mm -hmm. think i'm as good at that i'm just kind of sharing willy-nilly and it seems to have the same effect but you have a really pointed way of, of of getting there and providing so much wealth of information and educational content. I just love it. I think it's great. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I try to listen to the collective conversation and uh, like channel what, what needs to be said uh, today. Yeah. I love your account too, uh, just personally, because every book that you share, I put it on my reading list. I, I learned so okay. much from you teach in a different way but it, it's really helpful for me um cool. because yeah we're so aligned and so i i love it every book that you put out there i'm like i'm reading that next <laughs> so, oh neat so yeah that. yeah yeah i only i only wish i had as much time to actually read these books uh right you know as uh <laughs> it just never you know i think i said in my last book post like this can anybody find me an eighth day of the week that I can just devote <laughs> <Okay>. reading. <laughs> yeah, especially now. It's so I'm I mean, I'm swamped and know I know that you are um because what we're doing is really necessary. And yeah, I think yeah. I came to Instagram around the same time. I think you and I um are our our big shift. I think we're always awakening, right? Like life is spiritual and we're always awakening. But my big, big shift, I think, happened right around the time yours did. And that's when I also came on um, on Instagram. I think it was 2018 or, or around there. Yeah. 19, around there. How interesting, right? I mean, doesn't yeah. it seem in a way counterintuitive, like the old sort of model of like having an, an awakening or breakthrough or a, going through a dark night of the soul would suggest you you, you want to go off into a cave for 25 years, isolated, right? And, and the modern version is no, you get on social media and you start sharing about it. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. It's so funny. It's so funny yeah. to say, yeah. So, so yeah, I'm interested. Maybe we can start there because I'm interested to see like how how did, you've been a therapist for a long time yeah and so how did your um big shift change what you do or did it change what you do oh yeah no it 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 did i mean it did and it didn't but it mostly did um <laughs> you know because uh so how can i just sort of condense this right i mean the way i usually describe it like how i describe it on my about page is that i you know I, I went through 
I experienced like a really insidious, slow burn of a burnout. Like it was so subtle and elongated that I just was not seeing the signs, even though they were clearly there. That I was mm-hmm. professionally burning out, like working too hard, not smarter, definitely harder, showing up earlier, staying later, seeing anyone and everyone that would come. You know, um, just kind of stuck in an old model in more ways than one for for too long, decades of my career. And it just finally caught up with me. And um, a number of factors seemed to converge. It was like the, the creep up to turning 50. There was sort of a midlife crisis component to it. But as I like to say, in an atypical way, like not a red Corvette and a, and a, <laughs> a bear, you know, uh, or, just, or just running away and chucking it all. Although there were some thoughts of that. I mean, I almost quit doing this work completely. Wow. But anyway, a really insidious sort of sort of burnout, taking a toll on my physical health. Um, uh, uh, you know, all of that just seemed to really converge for me to stop me, to stop me in my tracks, to bring me to my knees, mm-hmm. to finally surrender. Right. I mean, I've always been spiritually minded. I've always been metaphysically minded and I've always sort of kept that. At, at a pretty good distance from how I show up in the world, including my work. Um, mostly just out of fear and not wanting to be seen as crazy and all and all that. Right. Um, yeah, but you know, there's gonna come a time. And if that's who you truly are and who you're meant to be and how you're meant to show up in the world, if you're if you're denying your offering, so to speak. Mm-hmm. I, I think if if spirit decides you need to be literally dismembered taken to your knees and dismembered to get the message across and that's what's going to happen and that's basically what happened so that Mm -hmm. whole thing really led to like a madness a real breakdown thankfully temporary madness Mm -hmm. um and um but I, i guess i was i had enough enough access to self throughout it Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. at points hardly any but enough plus my my mostly book knowledge and clinical experience of having walked with people going through similar things especially over like the last prior five years Mm -hmm. that i kind of knew what this was and i knew what it wasn't and Mm -hmm. so mainly what i knew to do was just surrender like a motherfucker and keep mm-hmm. doing that, rinse and repeat. <laughs> right. So that's what I kept doing. And the more I did that, the more I would sit, mainly, you know, lots of long walks in the woods and all that. But the time I kept devoting to sitting, meditating, praying, surrendering, long story short, the guidance started coming in, in different mm-hmm. ways. And right. um, so I got some very, very clear messages, you know, the, one of the, one of the first was was a message that that basically i got as the world has been waiting for you to come forth with all of what you are or all of who you are something like that Mm -hmm. you know and um i feel like i knew what that meant i feel like that was a breadcrumb it was a clue Mm -hmm. to just keep going this is this is by design right Mm -hmm by divine design and so that helped me to keep continue to surrender and from there you know just all sorts of kind of wild energetic things were happening and they're still happening and i sit and um i connect with some particular energy each time and on and on it goes maybe we'll swing back around to more of that you know the the real woo woo outcomes of it later but just just to say for now that you know i survived it by the grace and it all of that gave me the courage to just um just reimagine redesign and and rebrand and come forth anew and be fearless and essentially trust that the net will appear if you jump Mm -hmm. and that's what i did and the net appeared and i feel completely held and supported and never happier never more joyful and in love with what i do 
never more attracting exactly the right people. The uh-huh. outcomes are, are fantastic, and I'm getting uh-huh. to, I'm getting, I'm getting to live in that marriage of being sort of anchored in my in my in my clinical, and maintaining you know my ethics and my stance and my way of being as a professional, but I'm getting to be as fucking weird and out there as I want, and it's going great. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I love it so much. I love it so much because I hear so much of myself, even in that story, right? Like I love it. I, <laughs> I love it. And um not only that, it's it's so important that you know you, that you're sharing your story because like you said, you've probably walked through countless clients through similar situations. Yeah. I know that I do, and it's not mental illness. Um and and there's not a lot of folks that have gone through it and um, that are sharing their story in a way that people can really identify with. You know, they just, yeah. I just, I don't, I can't, I don't hear that enough. I hear certain levels of it and there's definitely a lot of stages and, and things like that, but you've got just a really, it's just yeah. grounded and embodied when I hear you. I'm just like, yeah, I mean, this is your purpose. You were supposed to go through all that. Without a doubt. I mean, if I'm not sure of that, then I'm sure of absolutely nothing. I feel like right. I'm pretty I'm pretty solid on that, that, that this is all meant to come about. You know, certainly I could have heeded the signals and the signs mm-hmm. that I was going to have to be brought to my knees and psychically dismembered, so to speak. I, I may have been able to head that off sooner. It didn't have to be as severe, but oh, well. I was too busy, head down, working, working, working. And, you know, I didn't do myself or anyone a lot of favors with that, but I, I can't go back and redo it. So I just have to accept it. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, I didn't know what I didn't know. And here I am. And hopefully I can kind of pay that forward. You know. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And then there's enough self there that you knew, because mine was similar to that where. Yeah. I, you know, just on my knees and it was just, I, it's so confusing. And, but I had known, I had read and I had known, I'm like, oh, okay. I know what this is. Um, right. Okay. Like there was, like you say, breadcrumbs and there certainly was that there for me. And I was divinely guided to who, whoever would be my, it was like a bunch of temporary teachers along the way. Go talk to this person about this, go read this over here, go do this. And it was just, um, the the synchronicity was so aligned and i felt so supported and yeah i mean it was just i had known about i had read about it decades ago and i was like oh this is what's happening right Uh, and here here you're talking about like spiritual emergency a dark night right awakening in progress yeah yeah i got very close to the edge like you very close very very close to the edge there where it's like is it spirit spiritual emergence or spiritual emergency just very close there um after a psychedelic experience months and months after months and months after there was um a big shift just came out of nowhere but again it was i was burnt out all of the same things and it has to be we don't change when we're comfortable we don't pro usually humans don't proactively change that's a rare that's a rare person that i come across it, it usually is profound suffering like you right. i had to surrender just entirely to the process and not know what it's going to look like and not even and i even knew that if i asked anybody they wouldn't be able to give the answer because it was my process that my soul I that I individually am having to go through. So totally. Was- Look, I'll say up to that note, you know, I've had a therapist mentor for 20 some odd years. And I stayed with him through this whole process, but he, I mean, for all his wealth of knowledge, and he's a former Franciscan priest, very spiritually open and aware, he really did not track with what was going on and uh and you know i guess at the end of the day i didn't really need him to sort of figure it out for me or know exactly what it was and interpret it i just needed him to do what he did was just be there and hold space and support me and let me figure it out right 
Yeah, but there's no there's no clear roadmap or blueprint, and no one person or one tradition has any answer to this. No. No. It frustrates my clients because they want they want tell me what's going to happen next, tell me what to do, and I'm I'm not your soul. Like you're in your own curriculum right now, and right. I'm just here to be with you, and um, you know, just be, just be with you because ultimately they they all end up wherever they need to be but it's just about safety and um non-judgment and holding space for the whole process to unfold um and you can have all of the the teachings in the world and all the the things to say like the right things to say but ultimately it's them yeah. their spirit versus them themselves it's them versus them at the end of the day stepping into past life parallel life gifts their multi-dimensionality all of that is being integrated at one time and so i don't know what that is for them right 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 <laughs> yeah i mean of course we we all want the the answer and the solution yeah. but uh you know in this territory boy it just it's not there <laughs> it's not it's not outside of us you know <laughs> No, right. but the things that you and I both do, we kind of work in the same regard as to uh, one of my first line questions with folks and with myself is where's the trauma? Where's yeah. the trauma and what what part? So you work primarily from an IFS perspective, internal family systems, therapeutically. M more so lately than ever. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've been I've been sort of studying and using that model since 2006. Uh -huh but I've gone in and out of it. And I only really understand now why in those times I would move away from it. And yeah. it's really very simple. It's that I was losing self energy access. <laughs> right. What it comes down to, right? It does. it does, it does. And then you go to the, cause your parts are hijacking the system and they, and they want to cling on to, to other things, yep. earlier things. Um, yeah because they're usually younger and more confused uh so yeah they're more protective and and so mm -hmm. i would at times i can look back and see that i would get frustrated doing ifs and then i would just sort of stop doing it mm -hmm. and uh i don't know that i could have done much differently maybe really it was just more meant for me to reach this stage post this whole experience and rediscover ifs and rediscover mm -hmm. how, how IFS has evolved into a life practice and a, and a spiritual path over the last you know, decade. So now it's like a perfect fit for, it's just really like, I, I would say I'm not an IFS therapist. I'm a therapist who uses IFS. Yeah. And I'm using it creatively and adaptively and spiritually. And it's just sort of a vehicle, it's a portal more so lately than ever with the things that are that are coming out of my work yeah yeah absolutely yeah. it's definitely ifs gives me another language uh to speak and meet my clients at like a part of you is a part of you is saying this a part of you is saying this and um yeah, yeah. And, and it's not uh, yeah so i'm always when someone's going through a spiritual experience you know, or a spiritual experience i'm always identifying first line where's the trauma especially with like religious trauma and i include like societal conditioning in that because that's a trauma of you not being able to think critically the yeah. group identification of of who am i totally so I'm, I'm trying to see where the trauma is here because <clears throat> things that we pathologize personality disorders and things like that yeah. if we don't understand uh spiritual awakenings and someone is saying I am God. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They're quickly put on an antipsychotic, correct? Mm -hmm, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, by by mainstream medical and psychiatry, for sure. Yes. Yeah. Not with us, but yeah. yes. Right. Exactly. When someone starts saying that, yeah. I get really curious. Oh yeah. I Absolutely. get really curious because if they were, if they had grown up in India, everyone, everyone would be, everyone says that. I mean, it's just part of the. The, right. the spiritual nomenclature there sure. it's like, yeah, it's like not a big deal but here in the west oh you're god then you've got to be put an inpatient you got to be put on an antipsychotic and 
Right, right, right. I mean, that sort of underscores, you know, what what we really have always known that there's a cultural basis to everything. Uh -huh. a, there is a cultural basis to uh, the labels, you know, mm -hmm. the psychiatric labels in particular. Um, there's a cultural basis to delusion, right? Or what we call delusion, which probably right. in many cases isn't exactly, but <laughs> right. it's, it always reflects the cultural, right? And it yeah. does. Yeah. And, and when and someone starts your point, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, you go. <laughs> well, to someone, you and I are just so excited to talk. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, cause, cause when someone wakes up to, it can be like their culture, current culture, but it can be past. Ancestral. Past, ancestral, past okay. life, parallel life, other, uh, that is coming through. And so I'm sort of trying to sort through all of that because it has to be taken within a cultural context. Otherwise we're traumatizing the person by being the one that is supposedly helping them. Absolutely. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Sort of a, a, a passive participant in that. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, with like you said, what's the trauma? Where's the trauma? Mm -hmm. I, I have seen from our interactions that that's your 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 laser focused on that. And that's awesome. Mm -hmm. I am, too, but maybe in a different kind of way. But um, I think that it's also about where's the personal trauma mm -hmm. and the collective trauma mm -hmm. right and that collective like you're saying can be multi-dimensional aspects of of traumatic imprints carryovers ancestral generational then there's this whole sort of off-label concept in ifs of unattached burdens right entity attachments all that mm -hmm. which can be traumatizing in the ways that they operate with people um and then there's just sort of the the collective psyoping and brainwashing of all of us <laughs> that that's a trauma right. too right. So, right in a yeah. sense it's like where, Definitely. where to begin if there's so much because trauma is multi-dimensional as you're saying um in itself and it doesn't matter and it's so i'm going levels out because i'm trying to see well what is going on here and it's even energetic with what you're saying to the the entity attachments so i became an energy worker because i'm trying to i'm feeling um i'm feeling where that's at uh because someone can be it can be totally pervasive to someone um and they not know that that's not truly at a self level a part of them and this entity is something that has to be compassionately and gently released at some point when both parties are ready for that <laughs> yeah yeah i know you're getting into that now i i love it i love it so much and in, and without really specific intention to do so it's just happening in my work and in my world it's total synchronicity lining up for me with this Mm -hmm. um and i think you saw i just did a part one of a blog post about mm -hmm. how this has unfolded just in this last week or two mm -hmm. and i'm still trying to gather my thoughts and and check get clarity from my higher guidance about what really happened in this last particular session where mm -hmm. we did kind of an accidental uh compassionate depossession i just found out about that concept yeah. literally days before and just decided I'm going to train with somebody in it in October. Yeah. And then a client walks in and we start to do what we think is just sort of standard IFS. And it turned out to be anything, but I don't know that I want to spill all that right here, but just, I mean, that's sh the shit's real. It's real. Yeah. Get wait until you're, yeah, you're, you're gonna, the discernment, the levels of that, and then the knowing before you speak about it is so yeah. important. Because yeah. it's something too that comes up. Um, I do a lot of plant medicine work, so um, I, and there are people that call themselves shamans, and they're not, and they're telling my clients all of these things. I had a client come to me the other day, and they said the the shaman said I was possessed, and they couldn't do anything about it. And I'm like, well, for one, 
probably not a shaman if they're not able to do anything about that. And, and for two, if you allow me to feel your energy, because I always ask, energy respects free will, I'll let you know. They weren't, um, they just had an atypical experience because of trauma. The shaman or whoever it was just wasn't trauma informed. And it wasn't atypical. They had a trauma experience release with plant medicine. I've integrated hundreds of people um, with plant medicine and it's very common what they had experienced. It wasn't common for the, the person that facilitated that. And so um, right. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding too with entities, <clears throat> you know, entities that are not in form. There's just because of religion and things like that with um, there's been a lot of scaring, scaring people. When I was, I, I came into this knowing at age five, I could see, Oh, I could see like collective thought forms or ancestral trauma, like in a form. I could see that. I didn't know yeah. what that was because I was in a cult. I was a religious cult and it was very much, um, wow. very, very based on like the King James version of the Bible with like a very strange translation to this family that was translating this. Right. And so I could see and I, I could feel that and and just along the way of growing up that I had to kind of forget about all that until I woke up. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. And so now now it's like now I'm training back to, to to do that. And I have my own teachers, elders, shamans, mentors that I have worked with for a really long time. And yeah. it's just it's all through but it's all it's all compassionately can be released and everyone has some spiritual attachments yeah. um and doesn't have to be like oh my gosh i'm surrounded by entities well i mean if you look at it from an ancestral view yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you look at like daniel uh fjords like ancestral medicine his work with like animism and those kinds of things like yeah that's ancestors are all around us and to have right. energetic boundaries with ancestors entities and knowing that um yeah some of these attachments can hold you back here's an example in my life mm -hmm. so i have my own energy worker and she was doing energy work on me and i for my my whole entire life i would just kind of i would always twist my right ankle and fall i would twist huh. it and fall but i'd also had visions that i had died by like falling like at this just visions of this well after yeah. the the energy session i could feel this the, the energy worker pulling this this it felt like a hand was grabbing my leg and pulling it out well that's exactly what they were pulling out was like that that feeling and i have not tripped or twisted my ankle since and i have done that for 40 years and so after they had pulled that out it was just a past life um energy that was attached to right the bottom part of my leg right yeah fascinating wow right yeah i don't i did not obviously realize you had an early cultish foundation yes. wow okay yes. yeah and so you were saying a minute ago like you had just sort of put it away until your awakening and of course you realize i'm gonna have to reconcile with that how yeah, that affects because right yeah so i had deconstructed so i spent the first 18 years in uh well it was like a version of baptist like a real not southern baptist but like an interpretation of of baptist up until 13 and then from 13 to 18 evangelical which is like i call it cult light <laughs> yeah. evangelical yeah. christianity and then when i went to college <clears throat> i started exploring all different religions and started to really deconstruct in my political um, up, upbringing. So that went on for about 18 years where I started, I read the Quran, I've read every single text. I kind of like went into the theology uh, mindset. Mm -hmm. Like I've read like all about Native American spirituality, all of this and started to deconstruct it. But that took the better part of almost two decades to get there. And I thought that I was at a good place with it, right? Like. Yeah, like intellectually. And it wasn't right. until it was psychedelics that I and then I spent time in a bardo where I was like, oh, OK, so I've got there's some other things here. There's still some things here because I had to get rid of the concept of hell in order to get kind of free in order to 
Yeah. There's just this looming anxiety that was in my system. This, mm -hmm. the, this just the concept of, of hell. And so when that was released, there's always just deeper levels to this work. Always. You know? Yes, absolutely. I mean, because I'm in the buckle of the Bible belt here in Nashville, yeah. so more and more so since I've put out, you know, no holds barred, all my views and my, mm -hmm. my weirdness and everything. I mean, just as I always have, but more so now I'm drawing people who really are in some stage or have just decided they're ready to really deconstruct mm -hmm. their oppressive ideological upbringing or people who grew up in bona fide insular communities, mm -hmm. you know, or just very dogmatic households, you know, the whole spectrum of it. Right. And I, I'm realizing that there is really no you know, graduation date from the deconstruction. <laughs> it just goes on and on, peeling like an onion. You know, it does. Uh, yeah, but you're 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 giving me even more ideas about, um, it, you know, based on however much somebody is ready for and open to all mm -hmm. the different ways, therapeutically, psychedelically, that it can be assisted and maybe moved along, you know, a, a, a mm -hmm. little quicker, perhaps, right? You've mm -hmm. obviously done all that. You've been pretty intrepid, you know, with your own, your own journey, your own healing journey. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I work with a lot of folks that are deconstructing and dealing with religious trauma, traumas, systems, traumas of, of all types. And um, I, I do, I think that psychedelics and for me, psychedelics, um, natural medicines and energy work. Those those three things um, yeah. help deconstruct that because I already had had the the knowledge of about two decades of reading about every type of religion, okay, and studying it, and was well on a path of um, really understanding and implementing Buddhism. I'm not, you know, like I don't identify with anything, right? I'm. A yeah. spiritual free agent. I know that all path leads to the same place. Maybe an ownness. Totally. Yes, I don't know. Um, I yeah. hate labels because yep. spiritually it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, but I had Great. been well well down that path myself, and so that way I'm more effective with folks when that stuff comes up because a lot of times um, where people have difficult psychedelic experiences are to those deep. Um, belief systems, their their worldview shifts. We know this, yeah. and oh, yeah. it can be it can be stuff that's so subtle that maybe they weren't practicing uh, religion growing up, but it was just within the messages, especially in your part of the country. Now it's in part. I mean, it's basically part of our laws. You know, we're now at this point in our <laughs> our history where we're de evolving, and now we're we're going back to using the Bible to create laws. I don't know what year we're even in at this point, but it can be that pervasive <laughs> that it comes out. Right. Yeah, no doubt. Right. I mean, we're kind of in the upside down, as they say, right? We are. Yeah. We are. <laughs> we're, but we got to trust some, that uh, some, something weird <laughs> for, at well, least for us. In our are home. The paradigms are falling and they're not going to fall easily. You know, they're not going to, the powers that be aren't going to give up their control without yeah. a big taking the wheel and jerking yeah. it this way. Yeah. And it's so, it's so tempting probably and easy for so many of us humans to get so attached to that and let it steal our peace, right? And feel that we have to, you know, fight, fight, fight. And maybe some people do. Maybe that is their dharma, or that's mm -hmm. their IT guy. You know, they got to get in there in the fire and fight the man and fight the power. Yeah. I have mad respect for that, always have. But I've also known that that's not my path. Mm -hmm. I, I can't be authentic and show up that way. I just can't. So, um, I don't know. I, I, I like to think that in, in just focusing on what I feel like I can control, which is really nothing, but <laughs> what I, what I can facilitate both internally and externally in my 
little piece of this pie here. I'm hoping that's enough. <laughs> you know, uh, we'll see. But you know, one of my shaman uh, teachers, an elder has told me it's not about doing the most like it's not about doing this big thing it's about doing really good work and yeah. uh, you know if you take a like i believe in past lives i've seen them i've experienced them which are parallel lives right like everything mm -hmm. now uh, is happening now and when i zoom out like very like neil degrasse tyson and like you are here now or carl sagan like very much like take a big, big view of, um, right. humanity. Right. And I, and I feel like a lot of us are, have taken the vow of being like a bodhisattva. I mean, I'm using a lot of different terms to try to explain the same yeah. phenomenon is, is that right. some of this fighting and advocacy comes out of burnout because I've been there and I've, I've done that. I've, 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 I've tried to do that, but it comes at a, a personal cost to to where there's not enough of you available for your family and your clients and your community because you're you're fighting for this thing. And what can I as one person do? So I I do systems change work, which is very slow and embodied. And I know that I'm not going to resolve everything in this lifetime. This is the infinite right. game we're playing. And it's moving from like that zero sum to playing that infinite game. Totally. And knowing we're not all free, but like until we're all free, um, yeah. then we're yeah. not all playing the same game. And so I respect the games that folks are playing, but I'm not yeah. going to participate in that because I can't, my Dharma, I can't, I'm here for trauma healing. Uh, that's, that's my Dharma is to teach about trauma healing and to heal my own trauma. It's both. Totally. And so I have to right. stay laser focused on that. Yeah. Yeah, you're doing it. You know, you're reminding me that um, I know that Dr. Schwartz, the IFS mm -hmm. founder, in this kind of later stage of his life, he's in his 70s now, and he's mm -hmm. still traveling a lot to, you know, talk about, do workshops and raise awareness to to the IFS model. But his his real focus lately is working with activists. Mm -hmm. um, because he's seen how burned out they are or they become quickly. And, you know, he's doing a lot of good work with activist communities on helping them to embrace the multiplicity model so they can remain more in self and mm -hmm. therefore be more effective in the activism work because the more parts that you are, the more agendas you have, right? As, as Schwartz says, the self has no agenda. It's all our parts with the agendas. And then we wind up locking horns with people who we're trying to persuade or convince or, or you know, get with our program or whatever. And it's not gonna, it's not gonna end well or it's just gonna take everything out of you, right? You're gonna wind up leaving it all in the ring. And like you said, having nothing left to bring home to your loved ones mm -hmm. and whatnot. And I, right. I really, I admire that he's sort of seen that need and he's trying to jump in and help to help to fill it in a sense yeah i love that yeah and and because otherwise what we're seeing is when we're doing when when the activism isn't embodied it's parts uh, wounded parts meeting wounded parts lots of agendas nothing gets done and right. actual advocacy and i call it spiritual activism is very rooted in self it's very slow it's collaborative um you're mm -hmm. embodied you're fully embodied it's peaceful um i i that's i i'm so drawn to like semantic experiencing and teaching people about like because it's another way to access your parts yeah. is is through feeling oh this is what it feels like to be embodied this is what it feels like to um, mm -hmm. to be here, to be here now. And that's another way to get into self energy because otherwise uh, folks are more identified with most of their protector parts and they believe that's who they are themselves to be. And it's like, they don't, they don't have the, even an ounce of self energy that's been online or very familiar with that in their system. That's absolutely right. I totally agree. We're kind of blipping out a little bit, Shannon, I think, but I think I got a little bit. 
a little bit. Yeah. I think I got <laughs> all of what you just shared. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I did, I had an interesting experience clinically lately with, with a, a person that I just saw a few times and I was really excited to work with. And in the last time that we met, I don't know if it will be the last time, but he has not chosen to come back because in a nutshell, in this last meeting we had, he had gotten himself convinced and seemed to need to convince me that his psyche was broken and he was broken beyond all repair. In other words, he was kind of giving over to, as I see it, a really nihilistic kind of firefighter mm -hmm. part, highly protective part. Yeah. That was doing a good job of convincing him it's hopeless, there's no need to try mm -hmm. to change, you're broken, your psyche's broken, it can't be repaired. Mm -hmm. And, you know, after dealing with just the sort of wave of sadness that I felt about that, you know, I, I tried to spend a minute, get ask my parts to give me space, let myself lead this. Yeah. And, and I basically said, look, I get that some part or parts of you really believe this. Mm -hmm. I said, I don't believe those parts. I don't because it, I'm nothing if I'm not someone who believes that we are essentially whole, that yourself is there no matter what you have experienced, no matter what anyone has, there is always self. I said, you may feel very far from it to the point where you can't even believe that it's there, mm -hmm. but, but I'm never going to not believe that it's, that it's not there. So you see what I'm saying, right? itself is always there always it's, there it's right. being reintroduced and yeah. or maybe meeting it fully for the first time i'm right. trying to say it in different ways it's because we there there folks are more identified with these overwhelming states fight or flight states have parts free states have parts the nihilistic parts the collapse have different sets of parts and with trauma, this is most of their experience. They've they've not spent a lot of time in self, but self is still there. Our nervous system wants to go home because self is home. And it just gets, I'm just saying we're, to clients, we're gonna update your GPS map. You got a bad <laughs> map, the map is taking you to detours and you're getting lost. And that is just what's happening. There's, there's if we update your GPS here, and we right. put the new upgrades in, you're gonna find your way home. I'm gonna assist you to find home and home yeah. itself. And I think a lot of times folks, there's a there's a period where it feels really ungrounding when you're in that liminal like space between constantly living in trauma and dysregulation to realizing who you really are yourself. And there's this unknown period, which trauma hates or protector parts hate they hate that unknown period because it's peaceful and, and embodied yeah. and quiet and yeah. what's going on so it's a process it's a process to get there totally yeah and i mean uh, there, most in that of the time. Way, yeah in that way of thinking my spin on that would be to say that most of our our highly adapted highly evolved hyper vigilant protective parts they don't trust it no. They don't trust because they don't know self and they don't trust that we've been there enough that we can lead from self. They think they have to do it for us, right? Right. And like you have to respect that, right? You have to respect that that's the, the belief system, the extreme beliefs and the job of those parts of us. You have to not align with it, mm -hmm. but you have to respect it and show appreciation for it if you're going to get anywhere to help a person get closer to self. Exactly. To know their self energy, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and and it's very, I love both somatic experiencing and IFS because they're both at the core very shamanic. Yeah, when you start exactly. to un, When you start to unburden these yeah. protector parts, there is such a release in the system that there's so much energy that's released and there's so much joy. So many parts are so happy because they're exhausted yeah. um primarily cool. that's how i experience that a lot of these parts are like they're hyper vigilant but they're tired 
there's there's not been an exception in my experience of using IFS that whenever we're working with a protective part and we get to the point where I'm having the person ask the part, do you like this job? How do you feel about this job? Do you want to keep it? It's never love this job. I'm, I'm with this for life. No, it's, 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 I don't know what else to do. Exactly. Um, I'm, I'm really tired, but I have to do it for you. Mm -hmm. Right. It's always along those lines. Always. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's either that, or you don't get an answer, which is, which is also not a, I love this job and I'm just going to keep doing this, you know? Yeah. It's unknown. Yeah. But yeah, to be able to you know, get to a point in that, in these approaches where you can help these parts not only to unburden what they've been carrying but see that may just maybe there is a choice maybe there is a way to negotiate a balance of power and responsibility to begin to try to trust that the person self is there can take over some of this functioning and then maybe these protective parts can even just entertain the idea of updating as you as you were describing it right yeah yeah some new and still helpful roles yeah yeah right exactly yeah. exactly yeah. yeah oh well this has been so fun no doubt i could it do it all day <laughs> i know i want to hear more i do i definitely do yeah um, maybe we should we should pick we should do a multi-part series perhaps we should do a multi-part series that'd be really fun to pick up and and see, because yeah. there we didn't even get into so many things. Yeah. The psychedelic work that both of us are doing, I know that you do, the energy work, your channeling. I want to know about that. Yeah. Yeah, that's ever unfolding. I'm in a process, an initiation for sure. Um, and I guess in a sense, I'm already channeling and have been for a while, just not in the conventional sort of way that most people think about that, like a voice. Mm -hmm trans channeling i have a feeling that's coming but i don't i don't really know because again i think the whole thing in being guided in this process that i'm in is really just about surrender faith patience and trust mm -hmm. and and occasionally i'll just get a pretty clear message that's usually some variety of you're on the right track just keep showing up and more mm -hmm. will be revealed so mm -hmm. that's just what i do yeah and that's primarily coming through um, some deep meditation. It's yeah, that's I get those messages when I'm in these, I guess they're meditations. I mean, I approach it as a meditation. I try to do it each day. Mm -hmm. um, but they're really, I think, more like communions. Like I do a whole process with my mm -hmm. uh, this this violet flame protocol yeah, yeah. and uh, I do decrees and prayers, a whole series of them then i just sit and tap in and as soon as i do some, some whoever's going to work with me that day is right there mm -hmm. and my head just wobbles around the whole time like this yeah yeah and i get impressions i just get impressions yeah. sometimes not um but it's it's difficult to say the way information comes through you know there is a kind of a clear cognizant clear sentient ability that mm -hmm. i was raced with it seems yeah. two, two or so years ago with this but in terms of my sitting daily process i'll just get sort of like mental impressions of mm -hmm. of guidance or messages yeah. at particular times that's all yeah. Yeah. so yeah, and we'll you can see. tell and you can tell as far as the energy like where that's coming from because you can feel i everyone's gifts are different and how they get their information but like what the discernment is how you feel it like and if you have like any fear or any trauma any um impulses in your system that's that's a lot of people are like channeling things i'm saying this because a lot of people think they're channeling things but they're not you can channel things from different entities but doesn't not all entities are going to be helpful oh yeah and, um Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of discernment and then there's a lot of work that you you as a person to receive the information has to do in order to make sure that you're getting the clearest message and you're not channeling things that are ultimately going to be destructive or oh, not helpful. 
hundred percent or channeling things that are a mixture of truth and falsehood, right? There's some tricksters out there. There's also, oh, yeah. I, I can feel um, non-personal thought forms and I'm teach clients like how to feel when that comes into you, when it's not yours and it's coming in. Um, because some people, they can identify that with a lot. And it's like a collective thought form of like motherhood, right? Like there's like these collective thought forms that you can essentially connect to, but it's not you. And people can be so identified with that. And you've got to really work on your energy and your nervous system in order to get uh, some, some some clarity, if this makes 100%. any sense. Oh, it makes perfect sense. And I've, I've been in this process and still I'm in it of that sharpening that discernment. I'm happy to say mm -hmm. that I really feel that for this last two and a half years or so, not one time have I felt that something not entirely of the highest and the holiest is trying to get in. Whereas mm -hmm. in the beginning of this, when I was still in my darkness, but some of this was starting to happen, mm -hmm. there were clearly times where my body mm -hmm. told me immediately something ain't right here. Uh -huh. Yeah. And even in one of those instances that I can recall, probably three years ago when I was at home here, one of my dogs was in the room and they usually are. And she got disturbed and that was yeah. matching what my body was telling me. So I kind of shut it down, went back into prayer, called in Holy Spirit and Michael and asked that for whatever that is to be ushered on. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. And I think that was the last time. And, and so anytime I've been sitting since then, I can tell two things. It's coming from without, not within me, whoever's right. connected with me. Exactly. And I can tell by the feeling and the vibration and the energy that it is exactly. it's pure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. It does feel like that with the head. It does. When I get, yeah, with the higher, it's, it's actually really hard to hold. Like when you, when you said the different ascended masters that you're working with, I'm like, wow, you've really worked a lot on your own nervous system to be able to hold that frequency because you're at the seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh. You know, you're getting up there in the dimensions, and that is so. I teach. I have a, even have taught some shamans and some energy workers how you have to still be. You have to hold your energy still here and there, and bring that through. And that takes a lot of work because it can be very ungrounding, and sometimes people are very dissociated when they're trying to do this type of stuff. That's right. Yeah. Absolutely true. Yeah, I feel like, yes, I've done a lot of work and will continue to. But I also feel that's why, you know how a lot of people sort of just kind of out of nowhere start channeling, right? Mm -hmm. Hear these stories. That's not what's happening with me. Um, I'm, in a, I'm in a long game process. And I think part of the reason is because the guides or whoever's coming through to work with me, they are, they're working on me. They're working on my system. They're yeah. purifying and energetically activating and all sorts of things. It's like I'm in a process that really, you know, aside from the normal work that I'm doing to become integrated and healthy and whole, my only part really is just keep showing up if you want this, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, and, and set it up correctly, call in your protection and set your intention but just keep showing up. I've gotten that message before. Patience, mm -hmm. faith, surrender, trust, and just keep showing up and the rest mm -hmm. will be. So anyway, I don't want to drag us over if we're, if we should be uh, <laughs> wrapping it up, but let's do this I again. Let's do it again. This was so much fun. <laughs> I've learned a lot. Me too. I just, yeah. I'm, I'm glad that you exist because you and I are, we cross over on so many things. And I just, I love that you're doing the similar type of work in a different way. And I think there needs to be hundreds, thousands of, of folks like us to, to really normalize the self-actualization process. Totally, totally. And as the old saying goes, there's always more than one way to skin the cat. There is, and all roads leave home, and you have to trust yourself and sure. your journey. And uh, for me, it's been really important to have mentors and elders um, with the discernment process, um, because otherwise, yeah. 
it, it not that you still can't arrive but there's going to be a lot more detours and i think there's more of that coming for me like i said i've had my mentor therapist forever mm -hmm. um and some other teachers here and there sporadically but i think now that i'm on this more shamanic deep dive and you know where the ifs is converging with that and with this whole personal process i think there's more elder uh type teachers uh coming down the pike for me for sure so so i'll be meeting you i'll be meeting you on that train definitely <laughs> they'll show yeah. up they'll show up when you need them for sure exactly right for sure thank you shannon this I was an absolute thank pleasure you. all right Loved see it. you again bye-bye Thanks for joining.